good teaching is an affair of the heart as well as an affair of the mind. Much of education is about stimulating that freedom. As long as it works to further an educational or a pedagogical goal, then I'm all for it. Hello, I'm Professor Bob Schultz of the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences faculty of the University of Washington, Bothell. Welcome to Conversations on Good Teaching, a 14-part video series produced here on the Bothell campus as part of the UW Bothell Media Project on Teaching and Learning. In these recorded conversations, I talk with the faculty who founded this institution in the autumn of 1990, as well as with our colleagues who have been recipients of awards for distinguished teaching. Our purpose is to provide to you, the viewer, revealing glimpses into the minds and the hearts of the University of Washington Bothell faculty. We'll look at how they understand their work as teachers, we'll probe into why they take it so seriously, and we'll listen to how they measure success in their students. We hope you will find this series informative, thought-provoking, perhaps even inspiring. And now, a conversation on good teaching. I'm here today with Professor JoLynn Edwards of the Arts and Science Faculty of the University of Washington at Bothell. Professor Edwards earned her undergraduate as well as her advanced degrees on the Seattle campus of the University of Washington. Before coming to the UW Bothell campus in 1990, she was teaching at Mankato State University in Minnesota. JoLynn Edwards is a member of the original founding faculty of the UW Bothell campus. She is also a 1996 winner of the UW Bothell Distinguished Teaching Award. I thank you, JoLynn, for joining me today to talk about good teaching. Thank you, Bob. So let's begin. I expect that you and I would probably agree that good teaching is an affair of the heart as well as an affair of the mind. And I'm wondering if you'd talk a little bit about what it is that makes you go as a teacher. Is there a, is, are you under the, uh, the reign of some kind of controlling passion or, or is there, a, is there a, a sense of calling about this or is it just some happy accident that you fell into something that, that you do so well? Well, I would think that perhaps it's both a happy accident that I'm here at the University of Washington Bothell, but it also is the culmination of a lifelong devotion to things cultural. Uh, I started my life as a, a student and then a professional ballet dancer. Um, I l have loved classical music from my infancy, and the visual arts have been a part of my life from very early on. I remember going to the Seattle Art Museum when I was four years old and walking around uh, what is now the volunteer side of Seattle Art Museum. So it, I feel like um, I bring to the classroom my whole self uh, as a cultural being. And, and when you say culture and, and cultural, have I, have I got it right that what you're talking about is what we sometimes call high culture? Yes. It's, uh, um, I know less about uh, popular culture, uh, either in previous centuries or in our own. But I really feel like I've immersed myself in the highest um, realms of cultural expression, not only for the European and American traditions, but I have taught myself uh, other traditions, including Asian and African traditions. And in each case, it's a, it's a reaching for, by highest, we mean uh, that which uh, measures up to some kind of standard of excellence and, and stands the test of time. Is that it? Yes. Uh -huh. that's, for me, that's the, uh, what people do to express uh, their very most, uh, their deepest thoughts about their culture in dance, in, in um, visual arts, in music, how a particular people uh, find, expresses their, their deepest roots. Okay. Now, Parker Palmer, 
whom you may know as someone who has thought a lot about teaching in our culture amongst higher education uh, faculties these days, has suggested that uh, good talk about good teaching ought to seek out the reigning metaphors that people use to understand what they're doing. For example, he says of himself that he often feels like a border collie, nipping at the heels of his students and encouraging them um, in, in certain kinds of ways. Do you have a, a metaphor that operates for you as you see yourself in the teaching role? Well, when we talked about these things many years ago as a faculty, I came up with the idea of an aesthetic coach. And um, I see my role as being someone who uh, can bring students to a certain point with uh, information and uh, readings and viewing of uh, works of art. Uh, and then I can coach them about how to see and even how to know. But after that, it's almost they have to do it. They have to incorporate those lessons into themselves. I want to come back to some of that, but let me, let me go to the point that in our program, we are very explicitly interdisciplinary. Uh, in fact, we've renamed our program as Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Uh, at the same time, you bring a particular disciplinary orientation, that of the art historian. What, what do you think is the, is the particular gift of art history to an interdisciplinary program of studies? Well, um, I think that art history requires the student in the classroom to use both sides of the brain at once in a very active way. Even if I am lecturing for, say, 15 or 20 minutes and they are taking notes, because in order to take down the verbal information and to um, have it consumed and subsumed into the student, that is um, very much a left brain kind of activity. But the slides that are up on the screen, uh, that is right brained. And you have to have both right and left brain working at once. My students find it very hard to be able to look and take notes at the same time. But once they get that skill, it's amazing how quick they can be and how quickly they, they see. And they can then have the basic information and um, perceptions, new perceptions, alive in their brain at once. That's a point I hadn't really thought about before, that interdisciplinarity is built into art history. Yes. Uh, we always think, as art historians, that it's the best discipline because of that. But, yes, of but course. But of course, I do other kinds of interdisciplinary work. Yes, talk about that just a little bit because, because I suspect that when you came to this campus you hadn't been immersed in an interdisciplinary setting that required you to be thinking about philosophy and, uh, and uh, women's literature and, uh, and uh, international political uh, economy and all of these things that, that we try to do, in, uh, we try to put in touch with, with uh, each other as we go. Is that right? Well, my previous jobs were uh, as a, a Ren Baroque, a Renaissance Baroque art historian in art departments. Mm -hmm. And that did not require interdisciplinary work. It required very basic skill sets mm -hmm. and uh, learning um, the canon of works uh, of the, say, from 1400 to 1700 or even 1800. Um, but my undergraduate degree, I wrote myself, uh, Comparative Arts of the Early Modern Period, in which I made an, myself into an interdisciplinary person. Music, art history, theater <clears throat> history um, were all incorporated, and uh, philosophy was a kind of big piece of that as I grounded myself in, in thought of uh, the early modern period. So I reached back to my undergraduate training, my own undergraduate training, when I came here to try and if uh, dovetail or juxtapose um, works of literature and art and music so that there was uh, friendly friction uh, among them. Maybe I don't always do interdisciplinary, but maybe cross-disciplinary uh, is a better word. 
for for one from one class to another, it, it differs somewhat. I've I've never heard you talk about friendly friction. I think that's a very nice way to to put that. And I suppose what you're saying is that you were you were really built for this campus for this interdisciplinary program. Yeah, I thought that when the job description came out, that it was describing me pretty well. It was very exciting. Yeah, and I suppose I remember very clearly one day when you. You asked me, I think, uh, to borrow a copy of, of a very uh, difficult uh, uh, philosophical work, Language, Truth, and Logic by A.J. Eyre. And what you're saying is that's just normal for you to, to reach out into other disciplinary domains and, and work on that, as you say, friendly friction between them and, and what you're focusing on primarily. Yes, it's um, a little poaching. And I suppose specialists in the field that I'm poaching in would be horrified. But um, you can only do so much in 10 weeks with students. And, uh, but in uh, showing that crossing boundaries is possible between disciplines and that there are interesting themes that overlap or even theoretical constructs that will hold multiple disciplines is a way of opening doors. And it gets me away from simply saying, next slide on the right, next slide on the left, and being only an art historian. And it does seem that our students appreciate that, don't, don't they? I mean, we, we know we live in a world in which professors are sometimes described as people who know more and more about less and less. And, and I have found our students, and it sounds like you have too, being responsive to an approach to education that, that reaches out in that broader way. I think the first time they encounter it at the 300 level, there may be, a, how shall we say, a little resistance because it's so new and very scary. And I tell them that what we're doing is risk taking. This, uh, it is for me, it is for you. Uh, in courses where I go across boundaries of countries from one tradition to the next, that's also terribly scary because there isn't a lot of time, you know, two weeks maybe uh, for each uh, segment before we pop to the neck. We get in our spacecraft and we go to the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them don't like that, but I really think it's valuable because our world now is global and to only uh, situate our sights on something narrow is not the way the rest of our lives really uh, are. Well, I think that's, that's right. If we listen to the news, uh, if we read the newspapers, uh, it, it, it's true that it doesn't come to us for all of the importance of disciplinary uh, excellence. The world does not present itself to us uh, in those neatly compartmentalized boxes. No. Right. Let's talk about pedagogy a little bit, um, about classroom strategies and, uh, and tactics. Are there, are there favorite gambits that you like to employ to uh, make things come alive in your classroom? Well, what I like to do, if I am combining, say, uh, an art history component with some kind of literary component, which I very often do in the same week, is I like to have lecture discussion on the visual in one time frame and then move to the literary in the next. And I can, um, I like to stop the class uh, so I'm not just lecturing, move away from the podium ask the students what they see. Sometimes we even break up into pairs for a little mini discussion. Uh, and then open the floor for discussion about what is being shown and what they are getting out of it. That's quite revelatory. Often students with very little art history background can come up with some very, very good discussions about what they're looking at. And then as we move to, to a kind of more text-based, literary text-based analysis of a poem or a story or a novel, um, my special, uh, I think that I've learned from my colleagues, including you, about small groups, which I did not employ in my previous jobs. And breaking students up into small groups with a task of a half an hour for 35 minutes, um, keeping them on task, then coming back for a plenary session and my favorite part is to just have the whiteboard clean, get a, a fresh pen, and have them talk to me about what they've gotten from the, the discussion. So that it's, I'm, I'm just a recording secretary then. Yes, that's, I, I remember you're saying recently that you like being in the role of the recording secretary. 
And it reminded me a little, do you think this is a fair analogy? Um, Socrates talked about himself as a midwife, uh, meaning that, that what he, like, and his mother was in fact, uh, historically a midwife, and he said, but I'm a midwife of ideas. And it sounds a little bit like what you're trying to do there is to help to give birth to something which in some sense is, is in the student. And you're, and you're bringing it to the light of day and, and uh, giving it expression in, in words on, on that whiteboard. Yes, that, that's pretty close to what I try to do. And then if we get a point, which I think is a you know, really strong point, I'll press the student to elaborate. And sometimes, very often, uh, colleagues from that same small group or other groups will then um, add on and I'll have sort of point and sub points set on the board. That's very helpful for the students who might not have been thinking so deeply. They can take notes uh, from the whiteboard and they can also see their own ideas sort of up in lights. And I, that think is very important. Sounds exciting. I'd, li I'd like to be there. Of course, I have occasionally been there. Yeah. Um, but now, as you, as you do this work, uh, quarter in and quarter out, year in and year out. Um, how do you keep yourself from, from getting stale? Well, the first thing is I've taught 14 courses at the University of Washington Poffel. So when one cycles around again, I don't teach all of those now. I've whittled it down a bit. But when they cycle around again, it's been two and a half or three years since the last time. So I've forgotten <laughs> some of the things I did that were... Uh, are some, some of the details of the reading, particularly when it's work outside my own comfort zone. Um, Asian novel, which I'm doing this week, um, The Monkey, uh, which is a Ming Dynasty novel. Uh, I have to reread the entire thing, of course, and uh, to think about um, uh, what the issues are that I thought were most pertinent the last time. But in preparation for a course, the quarter before, of course, we're preparing our reserve list and so on. I try and catch up on the reading and the, the newest. I do a kind of literature search so that I know what's come out since the last time I taught it. I often change texts for the students to read. In senior seminar, I'll change the mix of uh, short articles and chapters um, so that the, I never teach the uh, senior seminar the same way twice. Sounds a very, very long way from the, the storied image of the professor with yellowed notes. Well, I have a few of those, but I almost don't look at them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Jolynn, is, do you have a favorite course? I have two favorite courses, if I could be allowed. My History of Dance in Europe and America is the first favorite course. Um, uh, our previous chair of our department, Jane Decker, asked me, oh, do you think you could teach something on dance? And I said, oh, sure, why not? Because of my previous experience um, as a dancer. But teaching the history of dance is a little bit different than teaching people how to do plies. And so I, too, had to do much reading in this subject. And, but I put together a course which is film-based, because you can't talk about dance unless you see it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do very little lecturing, just kind of mini 10-minute slots here and there for some background. Uh, the students are required to read two texts and to really probe them to get the in information. And what we do in class is really what counts because once we see a film, then we go back, we may look at seg segments again, uh, they talk about what they've seen, I ask them questions. It's really as interactive as you can get. And in addition to that class, uh, I require everyone to go to professional dance performance and then write a review as if they were writing for the Seattle Times or the Weekly. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I've incorporated uh, group projects at the end, uh, uh, one group per professional dance company. And they have to divvy up the work about dancers and choreographers and management of the company and any other issues they're interested in and do all the research. And that becomes a kind of production for each with PowerPoint and film clips. And it's just marvelous. And I just sit in the back. Mm. And I think I really am their aesthetic coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that picks up on one of our goals at the Boffle campus, which is to, to develop uh, teamwork. That's right. right? And, and to make it uh, 
make it comfortable for students to go out here having learned to work in, 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 in groups. That's right. And not just be solitary scholars. Uh -huh. I, I like the role mm -hmm. of solitary scholar for myself, but I recognize that not everyone learns well that way, and I've learned so much from my colleagues about other strategies to get people engaged. And just sitting in a classroom and staring at film and, and then going home and thinking about it is not enough. And your other favorite course? Comparative arts in uh, 18th century Europe, which is, uh, speaks to my other area of expertise. Um, I once was a team talk course with another colleague, Constantine Baylor. I now teach it alone. I moved from France to Italy, to Austria, to England, with the theme of sense and sensibility, ending with Jane Austen's novel. And what I think I do is present some overarching theoretical ideas without teaching them theory. We read a little Hume, a little Burke. Uh, but I present ideas that were current in the 18th century and which most educated people would have bought into. And uh, then we examine the texts, which are art historical and musical and literary. And there is friendly friction there. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the students a little bit. Um, we, we professors have our passions about our, our disciplines, but of course what we're into is, is bringing students to, to where they can perhaps feel those passions and, and have the kinds of understandings that, that, that we think we have. How do you know when you've, you've really been successful with a student? When a, when a student has has caught, so to speak, what it is that, that, that you think you've taught? Well, there are a lot of little hints. I mean, you can just get it in the um, synergies of the classroom itself. Um, by week three or four, the foreignness of whatever we're doing to the bulk of students begins to be less so. And uh, if they're willing to sort of give themselves over to the project of the quarter, uh, then I already know that I've, I've done part of my job because I can feel them engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's most satisfying those emails after the fact from people who have finally been able to go to the National Gallery London and see the picture that they had actually written on in the comparative arts class uh, and say, I couldn't believe how excited I was. Uh, or uh, even students who didn't seem to be engaged at the time uh, who come to me later and say, well, I know I didn't do very well in your dance class, but now that I see <coughs> these ice dancers on television, I recognize all these movements. Thank you so much. Um, it's those personal things that keep uh, uh, teachers' courage up. I, I think, I don't know if you remember, that I've actually experienced a little of that because on a, on a course that I was teaching in Washington, D.C., I had a uh, couple of your uh, former art history students, and one of them was, was leading me through, uh, as I recall, it, it was the Monet's in the National Gallery in Washington, and, and uh, what you've just described as, as a sense of um, what it is when, when it all works and when it succeeds, uh, I think I saw for myself firsthand. Yeah. It, was, it was quite lovely. Mm, very satisfying. The larger concept for all of this that we do is education, right? And it's a term that gets bandied about and used in, in quite a variety of ways. Some people uh, seem to think that education is a matter of schooling and accumulating years of schooling and, and surely there's a meaning behind that institutional uh, set of processes, but what is that meaning? Um, one of my favorite philosophers of education uh, uh, says that to be educated is not to have arrived at a destination, but it's to travel with a different view. Is, is that a reasonable way to, to speak? And if so, what's, what's the different view? Well, this, I think, is uh, true for all disciplines, but I think it's particularly true for culture. I think once you have learned something about um, the 19th century French painters, and really uh, understood um, the groundbreaking of that avant-garde, um, you get into their heads. And you don't, you're traveling along your pa life path. 
you don't see the world the same again because you suddenly recognize that artists think. This is a, a, a actually quite a novel concept for many students. That artists are thinking beings who are part of their own time, but also who may be breaking the mold as they go in order to um, try out those urgent ideas in their heads and urgent new techniques. And so traveling, for the students to travel the road almost in the footsteps of the people that they're studying and understand the hurdles that artists face, uh, that changes their perception of the world. They don't take things for st stock response. They, and uh, it's not, everything is not a production like we have in high media and television and so on. Things, it's hard work to be an artist. And artists grapple uh, for long hours with difficult decisions on what to do with a charcoal drawing, with a design for a building, with a new musical composition. So if I can take them along that path and then sort of scoot them along, then I think I've done my job. So the notion of lifelong learning is just taken for granted. I mean, you cannot be an educated person in the sense in which you're trying to, no. to make that happen without being uh, immersed, engaged, committed to something that's going to go on as long as that, that student lives. Yes, this is, a, this is at the core of my being, this ideal. I really believe in it, and I have believed in the ideal of lifelong learning for for as long as I can remember. Um, every experience counts. And, but as you get older, the accumulation of your experience and your reading and going, in my case, going to theater, uh, each thing builds on the next. And so it, when you open the, the Times in the morning, hopefully the New York Times, and are reading in a section on the arts, you know what you're reading about. It, it resonates in a deep place. And I, I believe in that. I believe it's important. Our culture matters. You once um, talked to me about the meaning of education using uh, some kind of example about a woman and a well. C can you there's this wonder that? There's this wonderful painting by Titian, although we used to think it by, was by Giorgione, but they now think it's Titian. It's um, called the Fête Champêtre, and it's in the Louvre in Paris. And on the left side of the painting, there is a nude woman who is standing by a well, kind of leaning over. And she has in one hand a pitcher. And the pitcher is half full. And the way she's leaning, you cannot tell whether she has just leaned over and brought up some water from the well of inspiration, or she's about to pour in to the, uh, to the well. And for me, this is a wonderful metaphor about education. Ed educare mean, in Latin means to draw out, as you know. There's, has she just drawn out the water from the well of inspiration within the students, in this case? Or is she pouring in a little elixir? That is the double side for me. A few years ago, Paul Goodman published a book called The Community of Scholars. And that notion of the community of scholars uh, is sometimes uh, used to say what a university really is. Not a bureaucracy, not a place where people get credentialed, not a, not a place of just solitary interaction between this teacher in her classroom and, and this group of students. I wonder if, if the notion of the community of scholars works for you and if it's part of your discourse about teaching. Well, it functions for me on many levels. Um, for, the, for myself as a, as a scholar researcher, there is, of course, a community of scholars with whom I am engaged, both literally on email and so on, and conferences, and also a kind of community of scholarship of uh, what people are writing both in the past and now about certain subjects. My, myself as the audience receptor of that in information and interpretation. So there's, I have in my head, uh, as I go into the classroom, um, those voices. That's one kind of community of scholars. Then at UWB, we started with 12. 
And we were a different kind of community of scholars. I had never experienced being in a room with people of such diverse backgrounds and disciplinary and interdisciplinary interests. We had to learn how to talk to one another. That, that was another uh, wonderful example of community of scholarship. And in the early days, as you remember, we were able to read text together, sit around table, uh, talk about them, learn a little bit about where other people were in their intellectual growth. And then there is the community of scholars that happens with the classroom. And um, naturally, I think we all bring some of our own research interests into the classroom. The very best for me is when I can give them little nuggets and uh, insights that I have gotten from deep research uh, and bring that into a, a conversation in class. Uh, I think students are often very interested in what the professors do with their regular time or their other time, but also to get them engaged in their projects group projects, individual projects, in some of the issues that are current in the fields or fields that we're working in. So then they join the community of scholars. I like to think of it as a tapestry with a warp and a woof. And the people that I read, or perhaps myself adding to that, we are a part of that community that adds to the textile. And then the students join in with their threads. So there's sort of three levels of that metaphor that works for me. That's, that's, a, that's a lovely metaphor and a lovely, a lovely uh, account. It's a very long way, isn't it, from the notion of higher education as the, uh, the transmission of information from uh, the professor's uh, notebook into the student's notebook and later to be regurgitated upon an examination page. Yes. Um, this is a rather a touchy subject with me in a way because I do believe that you translate information. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, the, the model has been since the 70s, Kenneth Clark's old television series on civilization. I bring a point of view and um, 20 years of knowledge, um, which I can help guide the students. I coach them through. And I can tell them some things about music or art history or even poetry that they wouldn't know otherwise without a lot of uh, intense reading themselves. So I believe that the transfer of information is important. But what's more important is what the students do with it because information is only one thing. That's only the first level. It's knowledge as a result of really um, struggling with that information, and then from knowledge, understanding. And then you have those connections. And for me, uh, I keep telling my students, it's the connections that are so interesting between a poem and a painting, between uh, the structure of a piece of music and the structure of a piece of literature, between certain uh, themes uh, comic themes, for instance, that appear through a, a century or two or three. If they can make those connections at the, after they've gotten to the, to the level of information and knowledge and then they're really getting to some understanding, then I'm really happy. And that, that echoes a, a, a classic view in a way. Uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, who wrote uh, the idea of the university uh, in the 19th century, talked about uh, getting the student to see the world and see it whole. And uh, in reading him recently, I thought that is a view that uh, corresponds to what it is we're trying to do under the rubric of interdisciplinary arts and sciences at the Bothell campus. Yes, I I'm very interested in the parts, but I'm more interested in the whole. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you about the future. Um, is, is there unfinished business in this? Uh, obviously very exciting, compelling, and as you say, passionate uh, journey of yours. Are there things that you're looking forward to as you think of uh, Professor Edwards, uh, the teacher, tomorrow and next year? Well, I have uh, a not hidden agenda. My own teaching, I hope, will evolve. Some courses are going to drop out uh, of the curriculum. Others will come into the curriculum. Um, uh, I'm very interested in the short term, for instance, in teaming with uh, Professor Jane Decker 
on a performing arts course in which we uh, read texts and we uh, see theatrical works of art in class or study the text and then go to the opera house, go to Meany Theater, go to Act Theater, go hear musical performances so that we have a real interactive kind of uh, experience with the students and they can, ex they can be in the theater, be in the museum um, uh, in a one-to-one -one way. Because I think that works of art, uh, the resonance from the works, works of art are palpable. For an economic historian, it's very frustrating because it's not quantifiable what happens between audience and works of art. But it's there, and it's real. On the longer term, my agenda has to do with developing the arts curriculum um, and bolstering it at UWB, uh, particularly once we move to our new site, which will happen next fall. Um, we're in a high-tech corridor where there's a lot of interest among uh, our in demographically among our potential audience for uh, arts entertainment in the community and for the education of students from K through 12 and then community college and university, uh, both in music and theater performing arts side and the dance and then in the visual arts. And I can't do all that myself, but I would love to be able to provide a link with what they're doing in the North Shore um, school system at uh, Cascada Community College uh, as it develops and at UWB so that we have a kind of whole package. And I'm hoping that eventually that will happen so that we have reached out to the community. There are performances to go to, there are uh, art um, exhibits to attend, and that the students have learned themselves uh, and perhaps some even become professionals. Uh, in the arts field. I think that your, your vision and your hope augurs well, uh, not only for uh, those who will be uh, enrolled as students in, uh, in future classes with you and, and your colleagues at the Bothell campus, but, but also for the citizenry. And I um, mean, you know, clearly it's, it's a broader view that reaches beyond uh, the walls of the of campus yes, and, and up the university. Professor Joe Lynn Edwards, I thank you very much for engaging with me in this conversation about good teaching. Thanks, Bob.